Hi, welcome to Someone Else's Movie, the original podcast where an actor, writer, director, or nebulous industry figure gives a little love to a movie they didn't make. I'm Norm Wilner, I'm a programmer at TIFF now, and this is the other thing I do. My guest this week is Kier O'Donnell, whom you may recognize from his appearances in Wedding Crashers, American Sniper, The Runaways, The Dry, and Ambulance, among many other films and TV shows. He's also written and directed his first feature, Marmalade, a lovers on the run thriller starring Joe Keery, Camilla Marone, and Aldous Hodge in a story of deception, intrigue, and bank robbery. It's available on digital and on demand right now across North America, and it's fun, and you should see it. Keer chose True Romance, Tony Scott's 1993 Joyride, written by Quentin Tarantino, starring Christian Slater and Patricia Arquette as Clarence in Alabama, two crazy kids whose love story just happens to have a body count for the ages playing out against a backdrop of mob violence and casual Hollywood corruption, and supported by a killer cast that includes just about everyone. Gary Oldman, Brad Pitt, James Gandolfini, Bronson Pinchot, Saul Rubinek, Dennis Hopper, and Christopher Walken. Oh, and Val Kilmer as Elvis. It all makes sense. This is someone else's movie. I guess, I, you know, I saw it at such a quintessential time. I was in high school, and um, it, it was sort of, it was the first time, of course, that I had heard Tarantino's words but um such a stellar cast you know so it, it 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 really was the first time that i had seen kind of style mixed with substance i guess um and again you know being a t- teenager with lots of angst going on it, it's sort of uh it's 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 a sort of perfect film for um for uh living out sort of wild fantasies of of love and lawlessness and uh it, it, but but yeah, as a sort of budding actor at that time, it was kind of like you know the 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 characters are so incredibly rich and um, well thought out and colorful and you know the casting and it, everything. The direction from Tony Scott is it, it's just uh, unparalleled as far as I'm concerned. It just really like all comes together as this like wild uh, romping ride, you know. So this was your first Tarantino full stop. You hadn't seen any of the others or this was the first yeah, time. I don't think I don't think because I know that Reservoir Dogs was right around that same time. In fact, I think that they shot True Romance first, as far as I remember. And that but but that the uh, Reservoir Dogs had come out first in like 92, 93, um, but, you know, it, it dance and stuff like that. So probably avenues that that I uh Growing up in sort of small town Massachusetts, that I, um, you know, I was not exactly hitting uh, hitting Sundance at that point. <laughs> yeah, I have told the story on the podcast, I'm sure, but uh, Reservoir Dogs came to TIFF in '92 after Sundance because it opened that fall, okay, and I, I was covering. I was old enough that I was. That was really the first festival that I covered full on for the Toronto Star. So I was doing everything and uh, interviewing everybody, watching stuff left and right, and because. Uh, it was 1992. We, I was given, like, uh, press was given tapes frequently, video cassettes, VHS tapes to take home and watch the movies before the interviews if you couldn't catch a press screening, if the timing didn't work out. So they gave me a tape of Reservoir Dogs, which I took home and watched four times. Um, uh, I was 24 and it was speaking to me. It was exactly i mean it's exactly the same response i think that you had with with the the just the sense of the dialogue and the and the digressions and the the looping and everything else and and i have argued before that you know it it completely pivoted the concept of the neo noir because right around the same time we were seeing things like red rock west and one false move and right. um, yeah. uh, what's the other perfect oh, miami blues which mm-hmm you know, pointed a way for character driven thrillers that were much more simmering and Tarantino just has people shouting at each other from the word go and, you know, (laughs) delivering grand speeches about who they are and their philosophies. And yeah, going from Reservoir Dogs to True Romance, which just amps up the gloss and the, and the, the, yeah, the romanticism, right? Like Tony Scott is yeah, in this yeah. moment where he's just calm enough to let the dialogue flow. He, the hypercutting that would take over. And I mean, he, it was like a pause from the hypercutting, really, because he just made all of those movies and it was going to make more of them in an even more agitated state. But True Romance is almost 
luxuriating in dialogue in a way that he never let his films do. Exactly, exactly. I mean, I know he, you know, he of course fought to get this script, which I think at that time, Tarantino was quite easy to give it up as he, uh, you know, had had no money at that time. But, and and I think was desperate to make Reservoir Dogs and that was part of the deal. But um, yeah, Tony obviously just had such like a, you know, a great handle on the on the dialogue and didn't want to get in the way of the script. You know, I think he let it sort of uh, breathe on its own. Um, and of course, with Tarantino, it's like it already has this cadence sort of built in. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's 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 almost just following the roadmap, I think, that's that's laid out. Um, you, you know, there's I just watched it again recently, you know, for the, you know, many hundredth time. And you know, there's several things that struck me. One being, you could almost have a spin-off movie of any of the characters. You know, <laughs> they're just so like well lived in, and 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 most of them on screen for a short amount of time. You know, you think about like how iconic Gary Oldman's characters become, and you know, he's barely in the film. It's pretty wild. Yeah. And also, like like you said, those scenes, so many of them are. There's very little exposition, right? Like they're just talking about something else, yet it still conveys exactly where we need to go and and sort of continues to push you forward, which I guess Tarantino is kind of the master of that in a lot of ways, you know. I was really surprised to discover how little plot there is. Like they're really Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah. It's just, you know, it's a lovers on the run thing, uh characters who pissed off the wrong people. And they just keep pissing off other people. That's that's, that's the engine is so simple. It is. Um, it somebody... is just layer it, layer it, layer it. Okay, this person's after this person. Okay, we'll add in this person who's also on the chase. But you're right. I mean that that is essentially it's just lovers on the lamb, and then uh, you know who can chase after them, right? Just pour gasoline on that fire. But the the more we get to know Clarence, who is absolutely like a little Quentin just the avatar of Quentin Tarantino. And he's, he said as much that this is his most autobiographical script. Um, but it's also his most wish fulfillment script, right? Because he's the coolest guy in the world. He gets to hang out with Elvis all the time. He gets yeah. this incredible girlfriend out of nowhere uh, who falls so madly in love with him that she gives up the life, which is so much a thing that Tarantino would keep doing. Just the sense that women are redeemed by men and, and mm. need them. Even Kill Bill, which is about someone reclaiming her power starts with her. I mean, chronologically starts with her effectively in sway to this guy. Yeah. And um, and somehow it doesn't feel like adolescent wish fulfillment, I think, just because Patricia Arquette is so good at being a, her whole person instead of an appendage. No, I mean, it's so, it, it's so true. Of course, it like, it, it is bizarre, right? That it spoke to a teenage me, but it still speaks to me now, you know, in my mid forties. So it's like, it, it it has this sort of timeless kind of, of course, nostalgic um, feel to it. Uh, yeah, I, I I I think that there's something about. I mean, obviously Tony Scott as well. I think has this kind of like adrenaline fueled kind of sensibilities. <laughs> um, so, so he's able to, I think, take that the simplicity um, and that kind of like you said is sort of noir kind of like adolescent quality and and sort of like inject it with indre- adrenaline so it feels like relent relenting somehow you know what i mean it just kind of it, it, it it's just um it is it's just such a wild ride r- ride isn't it you know it just kind of uh it 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 from the get-go it's sort of like you 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 are with them whether you want to be or not you know and it uh, it never lets up till the bitter end. Yeah, and it just you know we've discussed the, the the piling on of characters, but it doesn't feel like it's throwing things at us. Um, something about the way Scott delivers it, and I'm sure Tarantino would have rushed through it just because you know he was making shorter movies at the time. Like Reservoir yeah. Dogs is 100 minutes and right. starts with the heist going wrong, and then immediately establishes all the stakes. This one just breathes into the circumstances. Yeah. But it also, as you say, you know, like it lets these vivid supporting characters introduce themselves and hang around and deliver, you know, philosophical treatises about who they are in the world. And I always forget, I don't think it was the first time I'd seen James Gandolfini, but I think it was the first time most people had. I think it is one of his first, yeah, things, yeah. And he so fully embodies, like this is, 
like uh, a fully formed character actor in his what late 30s early 40s he was younger yeah. than he looked yeah. and just comes right in and takes over and then <laughs> things do not go his way at all things do not go his way way but the, you know there is like i mean it, it, it's his performance is so terrifying and I think what really adds to that is the vulnerability that he sort of like oddly puts in there. You know, it's like a sociopath with a heart or something, you know, that he he continually like gives her chances throughout. It, but but that is right. Those scenes, especially with Gandolfini, it's like there's so much time to breathe and kind of like sit with the um, with that danger that it that it ultimately you know, it pulls out some like real human nature as opposed to like, we're just going to have this bad guy who's just really bad. And, you know, he's just going to be menacing this whole time. It sort of like unfolds these layers and you, you know, I mean, it, it constantly keeps you guessing, of course, but it also like it humanizes these people. Yeah. I mean, the sense that everyone is trying to make a connection, whether it's working for them or not. And, you know, that of course leads right into the incredible, um, Scene, the scene that everyone talked about at the time when it came out was the with the confrontation between Dennis Hopper and, and Christopher Walken's characters who don't really have any illusions about what's going on in the conversation. But and and on the page, that dialogue reads as just the most puerile adolescent dick waving, right. insulting, yeah, right? right? Yeah. Like I've got one up on you, and then well, I'm gonna go out with insults. Yeah. But but Walken and Hopper give it this this beautiful regret yeah right? like these two pros who just basically know this is only going one way and and walken has this formality to him that's almost almost gentlemanly and then hopper just decides to fall back on being a shitbag uh because he knows there's no other way out and it's just the most reprehensible torrent of dialogue but it it's that thing that Tarantino does that that th that line he manages to walk on the page where you kind of understand where the language is coming from the racist nature of it like he doesn't mean it he's just trying to hurt him with the stuff that he knows will hurt him but Hopper finds a way to play that as rebellious instead yeah. of sadistic right like yeah. Take like you want to play a game? Let's play a game, you know, and I'll kind of one up you and sort of like go out with a flair, you know? Yeah. And it makes up for the, the use of old men as Drexel, who he, like he's a really fun character, but there's absolutely no way you get away with that 30 years later. The just the sense, <laughs> you know, what's yeah. the, ex the early exchange? Like, is he black? He thinks he is. Yeah. And yes. that that kind of opens up that lays us into it in a in a safe way, narratively, but also kind of makes Oldman the fool in the whole thing, which is really fun. Like Drexel doesn't understand he's not in control. Yeah. And no, that's exactly it. Yeah. yeah. I, you know, yeah. I mean, you talk about the walk in uh, Hopper scene and it's, uh, of course it's, you know, sort of a classic at this point, but it does, it reminds me of like the scene in heat or something, you know, where they're at the table, you're just watching these kind of masters at work. And it, and it is, you know, similar to that scene. I think it's about like what, what's not being said. Right. Mm. Which I, I think as well, True Romance does so well. And, and and something as a young actor, I kind of latched onto, which was the, the reactions of people who aren't talking in the film are just exceptional. You know, in that scene, there's also, you know, I mean, just every sort of like subtle glance that that um, Alabama, you know, that Patricia Arquette gives to him, you can see, literally see the moments that she falls in love with him, you know, and there's no dialogue whatsoever. Or, uh, you know, the James Gandolfini scene, it's sort of like, it's what's not being said. It's this kind of, you know, it plays into that sort of cat and mouse game. Um, but I, I just, I always, I always found that fascinating. Again, the the Hopper uh, walk-in scene is, you know, when he doesn't take the Chesterfield, the the cigarette, you know, yeah. and he's, you know, he declines it at first. And then th there's that moment where he realizes, oh, this is the end. He's like, take out one of those Chesterfields. It's like, it, you know, and then it goes into that sort of uh, tete-a-tete, you know, it's... It's just there's there's so many beautiful just little uh, unscripted moments you know that I think are um, that support the dialogue I think or or sort of you know uh, tell you actually what's going on there and they're just they're it is it's just kind of masters at work. Yeah, I, I had the chance to revisit uh, Natural Born Killers last fall when the when the 4K came out and um, True Romance had come out a couple of months earlier I think. Or maybe it was the year before, but it was fairly recent. And I was just amazed at the, like the two Tarantino scripts made by other people yeah, um, yeah. that 
that Stone could not help, you know, adding everything, like ladling on all the visual stuff. Right. Yeah. And, 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 uh, and, and Tony Scott just gets out of the way. Yeah. It's so true. Like there is, there is a part of it that, you know, I've always thought, of course, imagined like what would the Tarantino version of true romance have, have been, but it's like, it's not that crazy to, 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 to think like that, 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 you know, that it was fairly close to that. I think, I think structurally the script, I think he had it non-linear, I believe when he first wrote it. So Tony sort of made it a linear script, but, um, but, you know, especially like the sort of the violent sequences are like very reminiscent of of the way I think Tarantino shoots things, you know. Um, so it ha- it, 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 you're, you're absolutely right. I think it, it holds the essence of uh, not just the script, but kind of Tarantino in general, you know. Yeah. I mean, I think the camera package would have been different, probably. That's the only thing I could think of. Like, it would be less, <laughs> less glossy um, yeah. at that point in, in Tarantino's career. It would have been scrappier. Maybe. Yeah. yeah, no question. Yeah, a lot of coverage. Tony's got <laughs> coverage, man. <laughs> yeah. Oh, but he's in love with the anamorphic of it all. He just uses the frame yeah, so beautifully. So many, so many like Dutch angles, you know, like, uh, which I just love. I mean, I think he got, you know, l- later on, he started getting a little crazy with it and domino, like everything, you know, so, but uh, there's some really like interesting use of it, I think, in true romance that sort of feels kind of you know, like almost romantic in a way, right? That it's this sort of like rose colored, you're seeing things through a sort of tilted angle, you know, of like, it's not actually sort of how it exists, but it's a sort of skewed perspective of it, you know? And um, it's used sort of like in odd spots, I found that that, that, that really add to that sort of, um, yeah, that that perspective of sort of the the tunnel that you're going down. Hey, it's Norm interrupting my own show to bring you up to speed on Shiny Things, my newsletter about physical media, culture, and the odd streaming project. Last week, I unpacked Criterion's essential Chantal Ackerman masterpieces, 1968 to 1978, which celebrates a decade of the director's cinema in three exceptional Blu-rays. Sign up for a 14-day free trial at shiny-things.ghost.io or find a link at the Semcast Blue Sky account. You like reading about movies, and I like writing about them. Come check it out. The comic book title too, I think, is part of it. Like it's 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 just creating a slightly canted universe where you can swoon into it, and and the and, and the stuff between Clarence and Alabama has to be real for it to power the rest of the movie. And again, live you, dies on it, right? You know, I mean, the the the, the chemistry there is. That's it. I mean, you know, they, they, what they they sleep together. The next morning, they decide, "I love you. Let's get married." And it's like. That is a really quick turn. What is that in the first five minutes of the film? You know, so it's Just like if you, don't, if you don't buy that, we're out. You know, and it's um, not only do you buy it, but it's like you are just immediately. I think, uh, or at least I was, you know, like on board, ready, and um, sort of, you know, fully on their team. Yeah, and this is a world where young lovers can unite against the world and and um, just be the be the center of the universe for this narrative that that's happening around them and somehow i mean i just keep thinking about how christian slater was being dismissed right around this time as a as a you know like basically a one note jack nicholson impersonator who right, right. Yeah. you know <laughs> fair or not that's what he brought to heathers and that's when he broke out and then pump up the volume really capitalized on it and it's a terrific performance that got no credit and then cuffs which no one even remembers anymore except ah, good old cuffs man yeah <laughs> And then this, and suddenly it's just like, oh no, this is what you can do with him. This is, this is, yeah, and it's also a great refutation. Like Tony Scott doesn't direct actors, which was being thrown around at the time. And it's like, no, this is all actors. This is all collaborative. You, you don't was get that right. That was, that was like a thing with Tony. That he... Well, he was coming off like, what was somebody once said that they'd done a lot of work, but they hadn't done a lot of acting, not in that film, but it's just the, it's a great <laughs> shorthand. Uh, yeah. For for that kind of performance where you're really just posing more than you are performing, yeah. and that was sort of you know the run of films he had: Top Gun, Beverly Hills Cop Two. No one was giving him any credit. 
Right. And The Last Boy Scout. Again, not movies with a lot of acting. And then this was his turn, right? After this, he could, he does, after True Romance, there's Crimson Tide, which is all like Red actor duels. He, you know, after True Romance, he just, you know, sort of adored Tarantino so much that he asked Quentin to to like touch up uh, Crimson Tide. <laughs> is that true? Oh, I mean, the, sur- the Silver Surface speech has to come out of him. There's nowhere else that comes from. Right. Oh, my God. That's amazing. Is that true? Is that really? He did a pass on on Crimson Tide and added a lot of dialogue for the supporting characters. I don't think he touched Hackman and Washington, but all the others, all the peripherals get dialogue that is just pop culture aware. Oh my God, I have to go watch that again. That is... It really pops when you know it. It, it stands right out. And the I know that the, um, I think it was Robert Town who came up with the Libs on Our Stallions exchange. Mm-hmm. For for Washington and Hackman, but yeah, all the supporting characters have have uh, a polish from Quentin. Oh, that is incredible, isn't it? Isn't it? What could have been? <laughs> That's wild. Yeah, but- there's another world where this movie, where True Romance specifically, turns Quentin Tarantino into the go-to Hollywood script doctor, and I'm glad it didn't happen because we got the movies he made. But on the other hand, there are a lot of generic oh. a-list blockbusters that could have used a polish well yeah and especially i think i think you know even though true romance did not do well i think originally when it came out it's like there were many sort of imposters after that that i think tried to capture that same essence and just um i mean s- still to this day right it's like uh it's it's a tale as old as time but it's it's tough to pull that off to make it look so sort of effortless like that you know of, of like what we were saying a, a simple story but then surrounded by kind of these like rich, uh, smaller supporting cast, it's kind of like, oh, yeah, just write a really like dynamic, sort of fun, whimsical character. It's, um, you know, he makes it look very easy. Oh, yeah. Hard in it sense. I mean, you think about the, the all the late 90s movies and he's in a couple of them. Tarantino. Sure. Okay. Uh, all the stuff that that rolled out that tried to be and it's it's funny everyone did say like oh these are all pulp fiction knockoffs but they owe more to true romance right because yeah. pulp yeah. fiction is doing something genuinely different yes. with with structure with character with digression um true romance is the one that everybody saw and thought oh i can do that that's right that's right exactly it does it looks it, it, i mean still to this say that's why i sort of say like it feels like a perfect film to me because it is so effortless and it's kind of, you know, there's just such like a, it, it, there, there's such a great rhythm and uh, everyone sort of fulfills their roles. And I mean that all the way from, you know, directing costumes, acting, casting, uh, you know, lighting, music, score, of course, it's, you know, it, it kind of, it all comes together in this sort of like effortless, like, yeah, check this out. This is fun, you know, <laughs> sort of like a easy breezy sort of. Uh, anyone can do this sort of way, you know? Yeah. It also has, I think, maybe the best cast of any Tarantino script, which is just, and I only get to say that because Sam Jackson's in there very briefly. Uh, otherwise, there'd be an argument. But every single person in this movie is having the best time with his dialogue. Yeah, absolutely. That's what I say. You know, it was, I think, the first time that I'd seen uh, Tarantino's words come to life and, 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 you know, it, it's only held up by like that incredible cast. Yeah. Do you have a, a secret favorite? Is there somebody who you've rediscovered since you've been rewatching it? Someone else who pops in a different way? I mean, like, I, I just don't think you can beat Gary Oldman. I mean, it's sort of like that, that. I think as well. I mean, had Dracula come? I'm trying to think if Dracula had come out yet. It was the previous year. Yeah, ninety two. Oh, it was the previous year. Oh, okay, got it. So, like, I, I'm sure that I was like well on board the the Gary Oldman train at that point in time, but it was, you know, I mean, everything that he did, especially around those days, was like, what? How could he? You know, he's just a like a full on magician, you know. So, of course, this this was um, just yet another uh, tool in his belt that I, again, as a as a young performer, I was like that. That's unbelievable that you can sort of like take those swings, you know. Yeah. And he was highly invested in not being himself, right? Like he was doing makeup for stuff and, and affectations in all kinds of roles. Yeah. Um, like in State of Grace, where he just sort of filthed himself up in the most basic way, but it completely changes the way you approach him. And, yeah. and Sid and Nancy, yeah. where he's almost unrecognizable. Just a run of films where he didn't want to be 
a type. And so he played everybody. It's true. Although like I saw an interview with him recently and he was saying like, it was not by design. Like it just sort of, you know, he did sit in Nancy and then the next thing, I forget what the next thing was, but it was like this sort of polar opposite. And he just went that way. It wasn't, you know what I mean? He wasn't like, I've got to, I've got to do something counter to it. Um, and then, you know, all of a sudden he woke up and everyone's like, he's the chameleon, you know, he's the guy who can do anything. He's like, sure, I'll take it. But it's also, you know, I guess that's, uh, that's the blessing and the curse of being a character actor, which I've found myself sort of falling into at times too, because uh, incredibly you get to play like a, you know, a diverse range of characters, but uh, sometimes difficult to cast because they're like, you know, I don't know. I, I know he can do this and this, but can he do this thing in the middle? You know, and you're like, you know, probably chances are. Yeah. But you, uh, you never really know until you sort of see it up on its feet. Yeah. That's a, that's a, an ongoing challenge, right? I mean, you, especially out of this movie, I mean, Brad Pitt is doing a Brad Pitt performance. We recognize it now, but at the time it was, oh, he does that too. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody. And like you said, Gandolfini is the first time it's like, I mean, talk about typecast or, you know, I mean, he, he, I think was happily sort of going down that road, but you know, you see that guy and you're like, oh my gosh, that, you know, he's, 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 we, we could grab him and just splice him into everything going forward. But I think even Patricia Arquette, you know, she was sort of switching things up a little bit. Um, Rappaport, that was the first time he had been on screen. And you're sort of like, what you see is what you get. You know, it's very, uh, he's very comfortable in that role. Um, I mean, everybody across the board is sort of uh, walking, continuing to, to, to slay his sort of like mania. Um Val Kilmer, of course, popping in there in the back, you know, it's, uh, that, that, that's all, I mean, speaking of Val Kilmer in there, right, it's, I, that was something that struck me recently when I watched it, which I, which I, I just, I always was used to the story plot, right, of Elvis just being there in the bathroom, it only happens twice in the film, I think, right, in the beginning and the end, and I mean, talk about a sort of like a bizarre, I mean, a full on delusion, right? That Clarence is having, but you sort of just really accept that. And you're like, yeah, man, that's cool. That's sweet. That's awesome. You know, and I guess we all have those sort of moments in the mirror, right? Where we kind of like give ourselves a little pep talk or something, but it's, it's to see it on screen to actually see him in the background and stuff is like borderline delusional. I mean, it's a little, it, it, it's, it's like slightly unhinged. I feel like, you know, that's, um, it really struck me this last time that I watched it of like, that is a bold move to kind of really um, to go there and only show it twice in the film, you know? Yeah. I once wondered one time through, I was like, well, is this whole thing in Clarence's head? Are we supposed to take that away? Like between the Hans Zimmer score and the, and the sort of gentle exaggeration of everything around him. And then the fact that Clarence does kill a whole bunch of people and get away with it. Is she does this too, right? Yeah, she kills the cop at the end, and they're like, "Yay, happy ending!" <laughs> yeah, nobody has a problem with it because that's the world we're in. But um, and and the the context of it is so different from other Tarantino films, where you know they're underworld pictures ultimately, like they're crime pictures. We recognize this, you know, like it's one of the defining lines from Reservoir Dogs, right? You kill anybody, a couple of cops. Oh, no real people. There's this this sense that you know the rules are different in these worlds, and this is the one where. I think because Tony Scott brings that eye to it, everything mm -hmm. is possible. Everything is acceptable. Like Saul Rubinek can be this uh, Don so. Simpson level movie producer. And we all just accept it because that's perfect casting for Saul Rubinek. He's the one I, I, I really admired the last time through. It's just like he anyway. finds this tone where it's like it's amusement, but also threat. And there's like he he makes that world work in the third act. Yeah. And by the way, not too much of a caricature than like many producers that I've met, you know, it's like, it's, uh, it's, it's not far from the tree. It's yeah. He, he is incredible the way that he toes that line and sort of, um, you're, you're laughing at him, but also with him and sort of scared of him yet, like, uh, magnetized by him. You know, it's sort of, it, it is, um, yeah. I mean, he completely fulfills it. Yeah, it's just fun. He's getting it and he's having fun and bringing us along. But there's we've already established the danger that everybody's in. So, yeah, he could go off too. anybody could. Yeah. So as a as a character actor, I wanted to get into this. Is there a role that you would want for yourself now? I mean, obviously, when you're younger, you identify with Clarence, but who would you play now at your age at this moment? 
Uh, that's a great question. I mean, yeah, of course, there was always Clarence is like the obvious answer that anyone would say. Um, gosh, that is so good. I Maybe like Bronson's character, you know, like he's so... I, I mean, you talk about that, like towing that line, you know, there's this sort of squirrely aspect to it, but it's, um, you sort of like, oh gosh, you just really feel for his situation and his, uh, it's just so cringy, but, um, but warm and sweet. And he brings this kind of like, you know, the fact that it, it, he has a sort of, um, a self-deprecation, like he, he understands sort of what is happening to him. And there's kind of those little chuckles along the way that are like, Here's a man that is just destined for failure and just falling apart as it as it crumbles, you know? That'd be so a fun that, role. That's, yeah, super fun. Super fun. And he kind of gets to, uh, you know, interact with a bunch of different, um, you know, characters, which which not many of them do. That's true. He's he's maybe besides Clarence and Alabama, he might be the only person who runs through the entire narrative, right? Like, right. um, Floyd pops up here and there, but he never leaves the house. Yeah. And Rappaport as well, kind of is oh, yeah. in there a little bit. But yeah, no, it's certainly, I mean, he has the, like, of course, the storyline with with um, Saul Rubinek and then meeting up with those guys and then going uh, all the way to the end with the, uh, with the undercover officers and everything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But you're right. It's not going to work out for him. <laughs> not, not going to work. <laughs> not going to work out. <laughs> But it's like, oh God, I, I do. I remember, I remember the first time that I saw the film and, you know, where there's of course the, the big sort of like Mexican standoff at the end. And, you know, when he starts calling out officer dimes, officer dimes, can I go now? You know, and you're going like, no, <laughs> no. I mean, what a great moment for Saul Rubinek too, you know, seeing that, that the betrayal that's like sets in on him. is just, um, I mean, he, I think he quite literally says, like, I, I treated you like a son or I was like your father, you know, it's so, so like Shakespearean or something, you know? Yeah. And yeah. And like Hamlet, everybody gets, most everybody gets killed <laughs> exactly. at the end. Exactly. And, you oh. know, obviously Clarence was supposed to die as well in the, in the original script, but Scott couldn't do it, which I think is really wonderful. It, it gives the end, it gives the film the ending that it needs, you know, like yeah. there would have been, it would have been tragic. Sure. But I think it's the reverse seven, right? Like if he died, no one would remember the movie. And instead the title pays off and we all get what we think we wanted going in. It is. It's hard to believe, right? Like I didn't know that for many, many years, which I think he shot the alternate ending, right? Mm -hmm. that I've, yeah. And so, which again, I just revisited recently and watched that. And it is like so cringy. I mean, of course it's not... Um, you know, I don't think they had like the final voiceover and everything, but it's like she starts calling out Clarence and being like, you're an asshole and all this stuff in the, uh, you know, it's, it's just like it does. It leaves you with a very different taste in your mouth, you know. Yeah. Um, but yet somehow it, it's also strange to me. I don't know why, but it feels like very un Tarantino somehow, I guess, to to kind of like to not like you said, follow through with the title, you know, to sort of like, I, I don't know, but is that maybe I, I suppose he could have gone counter it, but uh, it's um, yeah. I mean, it, it, it certainly needed the sweetness. Yeah. I mean, he's Tarantino is either full nihilist or, right. you know, tender, surprisingly tender, like the ending of Kill Bill Volume 2, where he lets people have their victories if they earn them. And redemption, I guess. Right. Or like some sort of like a, uh, um, you know, he loves his heroes, right? Yeah. Or like heroes, but it's um it it would have seemed strange at that point to just leave Alabama as kind of like and she's the victorious one out of the whole thing, you know? It doesn't uh it was always a couple's couple's game. Exactly. Yeah. It has to be the two of them. Otherwise and the three of them in the end. Otherwise there's just no like there's no justice in the world, and that's not the worldview that we we start with, even though that worldview may be thoroughly delusional. Exactly. Which is fine. Um, yeah. Sp speaking of uh, contentious worldviews, this is this is how I segue very very awkwardly into into Marmalade, where you have this sunlit beautiful relationship picture wrapped up in a framing story of a guy in prison narrating the the his perfect love. And without spoiling anything, uh, 
Tough that, to... That's definitely a Clarence kind of attitude, but uh, filtered through a completely different perspective. And, and I was just wondering how you got there. Because um, again, the people listening to this most likely won't have seen the film yet. We don't want to ruin it for anybody, but it does some things that I think uh, are are pretty clever structurally, but also owe a lot to the idea of leading the audience on into like further and further into this thing, this story that's being told, this this beautiful, clearly romanticized romance. Yeah, well, absolutely. You know, I've always said there's a sort of like a, a thin line between, um, you know, making an homage to something or just ripping people off. So, you know, it's uh, or whatever they say, Picasso said, uh, you know, a good artist copy, great artist steal or something. So, you know, I think that that's I started to look at all the films that I grew up loving, you know, true romance being sort of the height of it. But um you know, I think it, what what those films had in common was not only like an exciting, fun, entertaining ride, but but a sense of love and passion, and and you know, especially the Bonnie and Clyde sort of genre, and um, and uh, a, a sort of a narrative framing, so things like the Princess Bride, and you know, um, and and mixing that with a whimsical world like raising arizona and and anything tim burton you know in early days so i started to sort of take all those things meld them together and uh and strain out kind of like well what is it essentially that i love about these films and so much of that was um was that was was like the the these kind of like lovers on the run why do we root for these people and and what do they all have in common? Mixing that with like a sort of narrative uh, way to tell this story, uh, you know, going back and looking at The Princess Bride again, I was like, it's really interesting. Uh, you know, of course, the uh, grandfather is reading the story. We see the grandson hearing the story and we're seeing the retelling of this story. But at a certain point you go like, but whose perspective are we seeing seeing this story through? Uh, so I thought that that was like a really interesting way in. Um, and then of course I wanted to tell a love story. So it was like, okay, how can I take that narrative framing, use the Bonnie and Clyde genre that I love so much, and then sort of like spin it upside down. Um, so that was, that was essentially kind of like the, the jumping off point. Um, and then I, and I knew exactly like everything that we had been talking about, which is there is kind of an assumption when it comes to sort of these lovers on the run movies, you know, that are kind of like, uh, the simplicity of it, right? Of, you know, rob bank, get away with it, you know, go on the run, maybe they die in the end, maybe they get away with it. You know, it's sort of, it does come down to that, right? Like, are they going to get away with it? Do we want them to get away with it? Usually, yes, I think. So even when they die, it's kind of like feels sad somehow, even though these are uh, bad people doing bad things, you know? Um, so I, it was, it was sort of like really investigating that um, and jump and diving right into that right so leading the audience with a sort of a very familiar feeling and then seeing if i could sort of um you know hook them in order to to sort of uh switch it up i honestly would not have considered the princess bride dynamic but you're right that and you found a way to cast aldous hodge as fred savage which <laughs> that's amazing he's yeah. so beautifully positioned as the person who keeps calling bullshit on the story but also really invests like the more time we spend with yeah. him in that in that framing sequence the more we see how much he wants to believe and joe Curie is really good at spinning and just just pulling pulling us in along with him and and you know for a while i was trying to figure out if there was a forrest gump aspect to it because of the the nature of the story and and the accent the specific dialect that that he's chosen to work in but that also puts you on the on the wrong foot for the story to sort of you know snarl you or snare you and, and sucker you in yeah certainly i mean you know we did we sort of like picked and you know chose certain things we didn't want to go full Forrest Gump but like it was certainly something that we looked at you know and it, it, I mean again that that's a whimsical sort of like fable right all in all so that was that was in the arena that we were playing in um so we again just like true romance right like we wanted to have these bright colorful rich characters but there had to be some grounding there had to be the real chemistry that you really root for them 
Um, and we wanted to toe that line, yeah, between the retelling of this story that sort of has has some sort of, uh, you know, some cracks in the in the sidewalks. Yeah, uh, you know, and certainly, and like you said too, it was, it was kind of that was the challenge was um, whose perspective are we seeing this from, and th that was that was really fun to play around with, you know. And we sort of covered the the spiritual borrowing, but is there anything specific from? true romance that you have lifted quoted even full-on stolen is there a moment in in marmalade or, or your other work that that you can say is deliberately inspired by true romance like countless countless yeah i mean there's moments there's direction there's uh you know i i think like i was saying earlier the you know what's really important to me is sort of the reactions right and 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 having the audience feel feel something without having to say it obviously but it's um it, it is. It, there was like a big inspiration in that film um, that came from their chemistry and sort of like the electric, sort of dangerous um, uh, nature of it all. That that we that we you know went back and looked at it again with the actors and tried to capture something like in that realm, but also give it our own twist. And uh, I don't think it's a spoiler to say that we get a happy ending out of Marmalade in the same way that like the cynicism doesn't win in the end. That's exactly right. Yeah, that's exactly right. It was sort of uh, that was that was always the goal. It was it's a tough road to get there, right? It's um, you know, I've always said that the the script is built as a house of cards, so you sort of pull one out, and the whole thing comes tumbling down. So it was uh, but I always knew that I wanted to land with some sort of uh, in some somewhat of a happy place. Yeah. My thanks to Kiro O'Donnell whose first feature, Marmalade, is now available on digital and on-demand across North America. Thanks also to Angie Power and Alia Stationwala. They know what they did. Kier doesn't appear to be on social media, and good for him, but you can find True Romance, freshly remastered on 4K and Blu-ray in a fine new special edition from Arrow Video. There's also an earlier Blu-ray release from Warner Home Entertainment. And of course, it's streaming on Hollywood Suite in Canada and available to rent or buy on various VOD services across North America. You can find me on Blue Sky at Norm Wilner, and you can find this podcast there at Semcast, S-E-M-Cast, and on the web at someoneelsesmovie.com. The first year of the show is still available for just 20 bucks at payhep.com slash Semcast. That's the first 52 episodes of Someone Else's Movie, 44 of which aren't currently available anywhere else. And check out my newsletter, Shiny Things, at shiny-things.ghost.io. I think you'll enjoy it. Our theme song is by the last year. If you like it or the show in general, please say so. Leave a review wherever you've been listening. Every little bit helps. It truly does. And check out the other shows on the Frequency Podcast Network while you're doing that. Stay safe. Watch movies. Wear a mask if you go out. Get your booster when you can. I'll see you next week.